what a responsive audience. I love that. <laughs> Wish that were true everywhere. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Basiches, director and CEO of ROM. And uh, I am so glad to welcome you to We Are Made of Stardust, a panel discussion about the intersection of indigenous ways of knowing and Western science in Kent Monklands being legendary. As most of you well know, being legendary is a wondrous journey, a wondrous journey through the cosmos, as well as the exploration of more earthly matters, including the colonial roots of this museum. And yet, as much as being legendary challenges Ram to confront the past, it also opens a door for the museum and allows us to look into the museum's future, one in which we will work ever harder to become a museum where all indigenous peoples have a deep and full sense of belonging. So as we begin, I want to uh, acknowledge and reiterate my commitment to that future and to uh, acknowledge that the Ram sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, which includes the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation from time immemorial to today. And that's particularly appropriate to, to, to talk about that phrase in the context of this evening and what we're going to be learning more about. The narrator of being legendary starts in the stars with mischief and all her defiant, high-heeled glory emerging from the hole in the sky that connects this world to another behind the Seven Sisters. From there, Kent takes us through the history of the cosmos, deftly weaving the, the indigenous star knowledge and the exhibition's many ways of painting and knowing through its labels and other material. Tonight, our expert panelists will, joined by Kent, explore the rich science and knowledge undergirding the exhibition. Joining us is the moderator of the panel, Lisa Jackson. Lisa is, is an Anishinaabe filmmaker and media artist whose award-winning works have been screened at such locations as Sundance, South by Southwest, Berlin Ali, and Tribeca. She is currently working on a feature documentary on Wilfred Buck, which explores colonization's impact on indigenous ways of knowing. Again, very related to what we're talking about. And with that in mind, it is my great pleasure to welcome Lisa Jackson to the stage, who will be introducing the rest of our guests. It is lovely to see you all here tonight for this epic and historic gathering of uh, all these incredible thinkers uh, under the creative genius of Kent and Miss Chief herself. Um, I've been honored to spend the day uh, with these folks and engaging with the work, and I can tell you, you guys are in for a treat. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Leroy Little Bear. Uh, <laughs> is, wait till you hear what he does is a Blackfoot scholar, former director of the Harvard University Native American Program, an Order of Canada recipient, whose thinking compares Western academic metaphysics to the Blackfoot cultural metaphysic that is developed from unique relationships to land, the ecosystem, and the observable cosmos over a thousand generations in the Northern Plains. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Elder Wilfred Buck is a Cree author, science educator, and indigenous star lore expert who posits that the depth of knowledge obtained through indigenous methodologies are on par with present day scientific theories. Mm. Dr. Kim Venn is an astronomer, physicist, and specialist at UVic in observational stellar spectroscopy, who analyzes stars to study the fossil record of the chemistry of the universe at the time and place where the stars were born. <laughs> and Kent Monkman is a Cree visual artist and the artist curator of Being Legendary. Yes. Woo! 
Thank you. So, Kent, uh, take us on a tour. Thank you, uh, Lisa, and thank you all, Kim, Wilford, and Leroy, for being here. This is honestly like the highlight of this entire project for me to have these incredible people sit here with me. So thank you very much. I'm humbled to be up here with them. Um, this project began um, uh, as uh, a multi-pronged uh, exploration. Um, I was at first um, interested in, in, in kind of understanding um, knowledge about dinosaurs. Uh, I knew that this museum was like gonna be full of children. So I also wanted to explore uh, knowledge that is passed down to children and the knowledge that was been passed down in, in, in our cultures uh, for many generations and then the interruption of knowledge. And so when I began this project, I had no idea that it was really going to be a, a, an in-depth um, exploration of the deep knowledge, the, the many ways of knowing that, that really exist in, in indigenous cultures across this continent. I had no idea it was biting into something that big. Um, but um, so I was led through, um, through this project by uh, a number of different um, knowledge keepers, Wilfred Buck, uh, Pauline Shirt. Um, I was led to the work of Paulette Steves and um, of course Keith Goulet who's uh, supported us uh, with his knowledge of the Cree language. So I just want to show a few slides that really kind of reflect on um, the origin of uh, life in the stars. And when I created Mischief, uh, I didn't really have a way uh, of understanding the origin of that character. But over the past few years, um, my collaborator, Giselle Gordon and I, who also uh, wrote the, the text for this exhibition, uh, we realized that she needed a creation story. We were told by our, one of our, our advisors, Floyd Fable, that she needed a creation story. Um, and so this exhibition is really um, begins with her creation story in the stars. And um, she um, descends to Earth as a comet and she emits this pink gas and um, <laughs> this pink gas um, was actually Kim's idea, so we can thank Kim for that. Um, uh, and that was through a conversation with Giselle uh, when we were thinking about Miss Chief's origin story. Um, and then Miss Chief creates, uh, a, a, there's this uh, element created through her, her descent, it's called Mischievite, so we had some fun creating this meteorite um, <laughs> with her, her element, uh, which is pink sequins, of course. Um, made to look like a real meteorite. And then just uh, this, this uh, constellation of knowledge painting began as a sketch, uh, began as an idea, and it was about exploring the richness, uh, the depth of knowledge that exists in, in the, the, the wealth of languages, the wealth of diversity of languages in the many different nations that live here, um, the, the, the science that's embedded in the stories the beauty of all of those ways of knowing that are held through song, that are held through um, dance and stories uh, and ceremony. And I tried to conceive of a picture that would somehow encapsulate this. And so this was the beginning of, of this drawing of a multi-generational scene that would sort of like speak to that. And um, I, I do sketches and, and watercolors, and so this was my way of exploring how I would represent that. And I realized that it was something where I had to let go of all, all sort of ideas uh, attached to realism it, in terms of um, trying to represent, you know, what, what this multi-generational indigenous family would be wearing. And then the, the, the more I, I sort of uh, thought about uh, what they might look like, the more I, I sort of explored their relationship to animals, to plants, to stars, to, to everything in our universe, and that would be represented through their clothing. And, um, you know, this was made, you know, this project was made in a pandemic, so we had the limitations of uh, not being able to, you know, collaborate with um, physical, physically make these things, and I decided, well, it's kind of impossible to do that anyway, so we'll just paint um, the, the clothing but um, just backing up one. Um, uh, but this uh, 
also evolved in conversation with um, Wilfred, and um, we had several conversations, Giselle and I, with Wilfred about, about his star knowledge, and um, that I really wanted this painting to, to reflect on, on this uh, indigenous ways of understanding our origin in the stars, and Wilfred was so generous with uh, his knowledge and kind of inspired me and um, Wilfred is also someone that really is um, someone who believes in the power of dreams. And through that um, collaboration, I just decided to trust my dreams. And eventually this became a star painting that was really about uh, placing this multi-generational scene uh, in, in the stars to really just make it as expansive uh, and rich as possible. Um, and then, uh, as you know, many of you have seen the exhibition, it ends with uh, the stars. And so I was able to also um, paint uh, Wilfred's portrait. So the exhibition begins in the stars, and it ends in the stars, and here we are tonight. Uh, hmm. Thank you, Kent. Uh, well, Wilfred, uh, you've been on a long path with star knowledge. And, uh, and the relationship uh, of indigenous peoples, your own people, Cree people and others, and what the stars mean to us as indigenous people. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit how you came to collect star stories and what the relationship was to the knowledge that was held in the night sky. Mm. Ooh. Oh, don't you? Greetings, my relatives. My name is Pwame Negete Dichigo, which uh, translates as uh, he has dreamt a dream and keeps it. And it's been shortened to uh, Dream Keeper. And uh, I'm honored to be allowed to uh, take up space here today with these awesome people that are sitting sitting beside either side of me here, and all these awesome people that are sitting in front of me, because uh, in uh, our understandings that uh, as we uh, walk through this uh, this reality, that we're part of everything here, and our uh, methodological processes are involves everything. So it involves you, you people sitting there, you're part of this methodological process of coming to know, coming to understand, making connections. And uh, in that regard, when I first started this journey of uh, looking at Achagosak, those stars, I've, uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd come to, uh, being educated in a Western, a Western educational system, I knew about Orion, I knew about uh, all these, uh, the 88 constellations that were, there, were taught in, in, in the universities. And uh, I never heard one, at one point that there were anybody else involved in looking at the stars other than the Romans and the Greeks in the Western astronomy. And uh, it wasn't until later on that I began to realize that, hey, we all live under the sky. We're, we all live under the sky. So we, and for, for us living in Canada, sometimes 17 hours a night we're under the sky. So we had lots of time to sit there and ponder <laughs> what's going on here. And so we're all connected in space. We're so connected that we're sitting at this place called the Rom, and we're all Romulans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so uh, the, the stars, my people call those stars Achagosak. Achagosak, is a, there's a root word, and it means at, Achak is that root word. And it can be translated as energy, as light. And this is what my people believe. We are energy, we are light. And we are one of those things up in, the, up in that sky we see at night. That's, one of our, that, that's us up there. And we come from that place. And uh, I'm so happy to uh, be sitting beside my friend, uh, Dr. Kim Ben. I'm so proud to call her my friend. We, uh, she made a connection with me that was so profound. It, was, it, just, uh, it just blew my mind. I don't know if she knows this or not, but. Uh, we, we were in uh, Victoria doing a presentation at one point, and then we got invited to a ceremony, and, uh, a sweat lodge. So, and and Kim, we invited Kim along. 
And uh, so she came along, and she, she, she initially she said, you know, I'm pretty uh, uncomfortable with uh, the whole concept of uh, organized religion and all those, all that dogma that goes with it. But I'll, I'll come and respect your the invitation. So she came, and in that uh, in that ceremony, the elder that was leading the ceremony asked us uh, asked myself to uh, to explain a little bit about. Uh, our origin as Inenio, as uh, Cree people, where we come from and uh, how we get here. And so I talked about Pagwangis at the hole in the sky. And there's a, the, the hole in the sky we refer to the, the Pleiades, the seven sisters. And we call that Pagwan, which is the hole. It's a, a space in that sky that's a portal. So when, we're, when they're referring to a, a hole in the sky, they're, they're talking about a spatial anomaly. They're talking about a portal to another dimension. They're talking about multiple realities. They're talking about there's a doorway there that we, we can access the, as energy because as achak, energy, light is, is what achak means, energy, light. And uh, now we, in English, one of the terms we use is spirit. And anyways, so we're energy and we're light in our true form. And that's why our elders always tell us is that when we come here with Ashki, this earth, we're here for a visit. We're here, we, we don't belong at this place, we don't own this place. We're just visitors here. And uh, we come here and we take a physical form. For myself, it, it uh, has, holds a b very profound meaning because uh, when they say that, it relates right back to who we are. We call ourselves Inenio, Inenio. And Inenio can be translated as of the four. And so, we're told as beings of energy, beings of light, when we come through that hole in the sky to this place here, we take a physical form. And the physical form we take are of the four energies that were here when we arrive. Because as beings of energy, beings of light, we can't, can't interact with this physical world. And so in order to, to interact with this physical world, we have to be part of that physical world. And so we, we, we take the energies that were here, which were the earth, air, the water, and the fire, those four elements, those four energies. And that's why we call ourselves Inenio. We are of the four. And it specifically relates to that, that understanding. And it specifically connects us to that sky. And we, we are energy, we are light, we come here, we take a physical form, we do, we, we do our little visit, and then we go back up, revert back to energy and light. And at the end of that ceremony, this is ex exactly what, what Kim said. She said, I w this is, isn't what I w I'm sorry, Kim, if I'm taking words out of your mouth. <laughs> Say it She's sitting right here and I'm talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know what she said. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, at the end of the ceremony, she said, you know, one of the things that I mentioned, that I remember she started saying, it, she said, this isn't, wasn't what I expected at all. Because what you were referring to in, in, in regard to what you were asked to talk about, I can understand that, and I feel comfortable with that. What you're talking about there, energy changing, changing form, and then reverting back to energy, you're talking about particle theory. That's what you're discussing. And I said, yes, this is, this is what our people believe. And it, it made so much sense, and it, it, just, it just connected everything to, to, to going through the, the educational system and hearing about what my people did and how they lived and where they came from and all this stuff. All these things I learned about going through university was, was about my people, but other people were telling me about my people, about who I was. Other people were telling me where I came from. Other people were telling me about what I believed. Other people were telling me how I interacted with other people. So all this learning that I did was specifically through a Western point of view, written books, who, people who, who have made a living, you know, making up these, these fairy tales about my people. And we believe them going through that colonial system. And so when, when, when I heard uh, Kim connect, make, make that little connection, it felt so amazing. It felt so, it, it felt so free that, yes, this is what my people believe. My people believe in particle theory. My people believe in multiple realities. My people believe in quantum theory. And we practice it in every, every, every day of our lives. We practice these things. And so those stars, there's not only one star in that sky. And uh, we don't believe that that one star are, 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 was the center of our universe. 
because there are multiple realities. So how can we, that star be the center of our universe? There's so, so much out there that we don't know. We just know very little about, about that reality. And like I said, it, it's, uh, we come here to learn, we visit for a short time, and we continue our journey. And so in that process of uh, under, coming to understand this, I connected it with the languages. The languages are very deeply embedded in, 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 the, in the understandings that, are, that any people hold. And um, not only that, but uh, the, the energy of dreams, Pwamia, the dreams are, are a part of that process. And they're a live part of that process. They're not something sub, subconscious. They're not something extraneous. They're, they're alive and, and, and living among us. One of the elders went so far as to say, if you look around at everything here, at one point, somebody woke up with an idea. Somebody woke up with a vision. Somebody woke up with a dream. And they worked at that, and this happened. So in that sense, dreams are, are the basic building blocks of our reality. Dream gives us hope. Dreams give us guidance. Dreams give us healing. Dreams give us glimpses of possibilities. That's quantum theory. And, and they give us these things, and our, and our people understood these concepts, they, though they didn't call them exactly that. They understood the, these philosophies, and they practiced them every day of their lives. And so I, I always think back at that first contact, how two alien worlds with two totally different belief systems are meeting each other, and uh, what happened in, in that process and what's still happening today with all the misunderstandings that are happening. But right now, like, uh, like uh, one of our elders, uh, Amethyst, mentioned that uh, we're ready. We're getting ready, the, the buffalo. They're coming back because we're ready to receive them. At one point, we weren't. The star knowledge is coming back because we're ready to receive them now. We're ready. We're, we're decolonizing ourselves. And we're saying, okay, the validity of our people is right here, and we have we have to uh, take it. We have to say this is this is reality, and we have to tell our kids this is the reality. This is your this is your reality, and this is your belief system, and this is who you are, and any concept that our people hold is on par with any concept, scientific concept, on the face of this earth. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> I started ranting and raving. And <laughs> yeah, I think you covered it. <laughs> uh, Leroy, uh, I wanted to speak with you. Uh, we've crossed paths uh, over the years, and I know that uh, for many years you've been at this intersection of Western science and indigenous knowledge, uh, bringing together these perspectives, engaging in real dialogue, which I will tell you, I never really understood what dialogue was until I met uh, Leroy and understood what it meant to really listen to another person or another culture's perspective. Uh, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, why uh, you think it's important to bring uh, these perspectives together and some of your experience with that. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. And firstly, I want to thank Kent and his whole team, Ram, for putting on this type of dialogue. And I'm very honored to be part of the panelists, you know, this evening. That and learning, you know, is something that's lifelong. You never stop learning. So I'm very honored to be able to share some thoughts with our audience. But I want to, before I do that, I wanted to tell the audience that we from the plains are Blackfoot, but we've uh, lost our identity ever since Canada became metric. <laughs> the 
<laughs> Rock meter doesn't sound very good. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking about language, of course, going back and forth between Blackfoot or Cree, in my case, Blackfoot, and English and so on, and we always sometimes get into arguments with, uh, debates with scientists, let me say, and one of, the, one of these words that we've had debates about was we indigenous people talk about buffalo and in the show we have the uh, great big buffalo as part of the show. But the Western scientists tell us, no, it's not buffalo. And because buffaloes are associated with water, they're over there in Africa. Over here, it's bison, bison is their, is their explanation. And <clears throat> so, talking about bison, some of you may have heard about this buffalo father taken his son to college and he dropped him off in front of the school and all he said was, bye son. (laughs) 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 But trying to come, you know, come about and bring about a, uh, an intersection of indigenous ways of knowing and Western notions about science is a very inter- interesting trip to take. And that's what's so fantastic about being legendary, the show. Kent taking us through this very interesting uh, journey, so on. I like my favorite scientists, you know, we used to drink together, Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his explanation about science was, it's a search for reality. It's a search for reality. When I understood what he meant by that, I said, geez, we've always been scientists. We have been scientists from way back right through to the present. Why? Well, because we have very different ways of knowing and coming to know things. And of course, that's based on a very different set of metaphysics, paradigms, which we use as interpretive templates for reality structuring. See? So Western notions have different, their interpretive template, Blackfoot, Cree, Anishinaabe, and so on have their interpretive templates. And as I tell people uh, that I've had a chance to share ideas with, they, uh, that every morning we wake up and we think we're waking up to a reality. Well, a quantum physicist by the name of Steven Weinberg, and he's a Nobel Prize winner and so on. He says, hey, there is an objective reality out there. There is. But as soon as you put a human being in the picture, it becomes an interpretation. So you're no longer dealing with the objective reality you're dealing 
with the human interpretation. In other words, those metaphysics that we wake up with every morning, see. And consequently, when you think about it that way, all these different cultures have their own interpretive template, and that's all they are, see. Yet, hey, all we have to do is look at wars and so on. Hey, we fight whole wars over those interpretive templates, see. So, the thing is, when we're talking really about science and that trying to capture that in language, okay, we have a very different way of thinking. So in, the, in English or other Euro languages, what we come up with are, hey, certain, certain ways of thinking. And in most cases, we are, we think about matter is really a foundational base, matter, see? And space is a place for matter, see? Whereas in Blackfoot thought, it's not about matter, it's about energy waves. And as Wilford was saying, hey, it's about light and so on. So when I say in Blackfoot, it really speaks up, be really speaks to this light, and this energy force. See? And it's really asking, how are you connected? In other words, how are you connected to all these other energy waves and so on? So we're really about energy forces. And we're not thinking about it in terms of matter. Now, let me just throw out as prior to the show, Kent and I were having a little bit of uh, discussion. And we were talking about a, a, a linguist who actually did the count, and, but he was studying Navajo. And in the Navajo language, you know, the very simple English verb to go, you know, to go, you can conjugate that word to go as best as you can translate it 354,000 different ways. <laughs> Think about that. Just that very simple deal. Now, for comparison, the Oxford English Dictionary has not had, I don't think it has a million words in it, maybe inching up on it because of texting. <laughs> <laughs> but it would take only three Navajo sayings <laughs> I surpassed the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> so that's how rich our languages are. See? And how I try to get that notion across, as Kent and I were talking about it, was think of a, uh, a, a chemist and their periodic table of the elements, a good chemist can, you know, make all different combinations and so on, okay? 
with those elements. Well, if I'm a Euro language speaker, a good English speaker, usually I'm carrying around that Oxford English Dictionary in my head. Okay. That's why we get, you know, vocabulary lessons and so on. See. But in Blackfoot, I'm not carrying around any Oxford English Dictionary in my mind. I'm carrying around my periodic table of primary sounds. And like the good chemist, hey, a good Blackfoot speaker makes all these different combinations. So I make up the language as I go. And because I'm making it up as I go, it's kind of like watching something happening over here. And I'm making it up by watching this happening. I'm making up the language. Okay. And that's using that periodic table of primary sounds. Any one of those sounds by themselves, in most cases, don't mean anything. Okay. It's the combination it's the relationship of the sounds that bring about the meaning. See. So one of the things it seems that we have to really stop and think about is what those metaphysics and paradigms do to us. We think we're free, you know, we're th that we're free to think any which way we want. But that's not true. You know, your language, your culture, those metaphysics really colonize you. Okay? And how you think. See? So let me just throw out a couple examples. My wife, Amethyst, uh, likes to talk about, and that is singing English, the ordinary English sentence is A is B. See? A equals B. Well, when you stop and really think about it, if A and B are the same, why do you need B? <laughs> See, the implications and ramifications of that is that our elders say, I am, I am the environment, I am the land. See, I don't need the other side, the, equal, the other side of the equal sign. See, I am. So, talking to artists, we said, we don't have no word in Blackfoot or Cree and that, that's, that says art, because I am art. Somebody once asked me, who the hell is art? <laughs> <laughs> so, if we stop and think about that, that really makes you stop and really have to change a way of thinking. Another example that Amethyst talks about is, in English, a dog is a dog is a dog is a dog, okay? But in Blackfoot, imitao, if you asked another Blackfoot speaker for simplicity, you told him to translate him into English, he would say dog. But that's not really the deep meaning of it. The deep meaning is a being of some kind that's on the move. We never say what it really is. It may appear this way, right now, 
but because of flux notions, flux way of thinking, it can transform and so on anytime. See? So that's something that's, you know, again, you have to look at those deep meanings that are very scientific. I'll give you one more and an example. Talking to a Haida elder, I can't remember how the, uh, it came into the conversation, but we ended up talking about dynamics without motion. Dynamics without motion. Well, when you think about that, in English, that's an impossibility. You can't have dynamics without motion. But the Haida elder thought for a while, and he said, oh, easy to explain. He says, you know, being from the coast, he says, if you were to go out on the ocean and row your canoe far enough from the land where you can't see the land anymore, can't use the land as a reference, you know your canoe is moving because you're rowing it, okay? But 360 degrees around you, you're always the same distance from the horizon. Dynamics without motion. <laughs> See? In other words, that's how different the language is. And consequently, the science associated with that become, and so on. Let me stop there and maybe we can delve into other notions just a little bit later in the discussion. Wow, multi-dimensionality. <laughs> multi-dimensionality, I feel mischief in the room, uh, <laughs> creating layers of meaning and unpacking things and just trickstering through and uh, maybe unseating things we think are solid. And uh, I want to uh, shift to Kim, who one of Kim's areas of research is about dark matter. And of course, science isn't set in stone. It's constantly evolving, constantly having to adapt. And uh, Kim has been sort of blowing our mind with all sorts of um, insights uh, into the way our universe kind of keeps unfolding in the way that it behaves. So I was hoping, Kim, that you could help to tell us a little bit about the mysterious uh, dark matter and the research uh, that you do with it and also how it's evolved. So f before I answer that question, first of all, thank you all for coming tonight because this is an amazing panel right here. Look at <laughs> Wilfred, Leroy, Kent, <laughs> Lisa. And uh, so I, I, um, I've never been on a panel like this. I feel so honored. Uh, and Wilfred is absolutely, he tells the story um, really well, better than I do because I think I was also crying and distraught and, and emotional, and it was not at all what I expected. It was amazing. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you both to Wilfred and Lisa for setting that up. That was very important. Um, and Kent, wow. If you haven't seen the ex exhibition yet, I hope you're going to, because it is truly amazing. The paintings are fantastic. The exhibition is fantastic, and the descriptions are both funny and creative and brilliant, and I'm just, uh, com again, completely in awe. So thank you, um, everyone. All right, so <laughs> about science then. I don't know where to pick up. I don't know where to pick up from what Wilfred said or from what, what Leroy said. 
Um, but I would like to add one thing, um, maybe a f few things. Um, but in particular, one thing, which is Leroy was just discussing the periodic table. And uh, I'm really rooted in that. <laughs> you, you opened up that, you know, this is a colonial way of thinking, and holy, I have to admit, I am very much rooted in the periodic table, and I almost want to apologize to you for it. But I, I would like to present something interesting from it, though, and that is that the periodic table of elements that, that Leroy was mentioning um, actually have fingerprints in the stars. And this is what I study, this is what I, I do, and this is what I love doing. I love that I can take light, even the light from here, but preferably from stars, it's more interesting, and break it up into its component colors. And on top of those colors are usually little patterns, little dark patterns that you can interpret in terms of different elements. And so what I, I do, literally what I do, is I take light from telescopes. The telescopes are just simply to collect the light. It sends it through a spectrograph um, and uh, breaks it up into its components. And then I interpret the chemical composition of those stars from today, like the sun, right back to the, as far as I can go to old, old stars to try to really use stars like fossils, truly like fossils. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I want to say is whenever I would say this over the last 30 years as an astronomer, um, most people would just kind of glaze over. S spectroscopy. <laughs> this is not the first time anyone's tripped up on that word. And, um, and, and fair enough. But what I've noticed is with the James Webb Space Telescope, people are actually starting to embrace it now because Unlike Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope uses uh, wavelengths of light that our eyes don't see. So every image you look at is actually a reconstruction into, uh, from a filter that, uh, that our eyes can't see in the infrared into light that we can see. And on top of that, the James Webb Space Telescope is using spectroscopy to find the fingerprints of biomarkers on exoplanets. And holy, like honestly, I. Did not when Giselle and I were in college together. I did not see that coming. I did, did not think that this would be happening in my lifetime. Um, so it's exciting because it opens up people understanding spectroscopy and the periodic table a little bit more. Um, I could I can go two ways with where I want to go with this. I could jump to talking about um, life on other planets and life in other worlds, which would connect to what Wilfred was saying but you did ask a different question. Follow your heart. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, sorry, Wilfred. <laughs> I'm going to follow with the question. So something that we've been talking about quite a bit, and I, I think is a super interesting topic, is, um, is the interpretation and understanding of dark matter. So this is something that all scientists live with now. Um, we feel that we have really good measurements of this, and I want to hi highlight as well that this also started more or less in, in my lifetime. When I was in graduate school, uh, when I was an undergraduate starting astronomy at the University of Toronto, just down the road from here, uh, what I was taught is that the galaxy formed by a, a thousand billion particles coming together all at once at, right after the universe began and made stars and made us. And, and uh, in the time that I've been in in astronomy, it was discovered that there were predictions from that that don't, don't, uh, don't hold up. So for example, in the center of our galaxy, there's not nearly enough mass to make that theory work. And in the outer parts of our galaxy, there's way too much. <laughs> and so this, this came to the idea of dark matter. And, uh, and if there is dark matter in our galaxy, there's dark matter in other galaxies, we, we find it all around. There's so much more, and it's not just like a little bit, factors of 10 to 100, too little in the middle, too much in the outer edges. And uh, so th this interpretation of dark matter completely changes how we think galaxies form. We don't think that a thousand billion particles come together, we think maybe a million particles come together, and then those million particles, and there's millions of them, and then they start to form together. Uh, so things merge together and come together. And this is a, a dark matter theory for the formation of galaxies in the universe. And, uh, and, and what, I, what I love about this is that the, the story changed. It really changed. The textbooks absolutely went from one to the other based on new data, new information. Mm -hmm. What's amazing is while you all may have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope because it is pretty spectacular, 
there's another telescope that Europe launched called Gaia. And amongst the astronomy community, the Gaia satellite is, is pretty exciting as well. What the Gaia satellite is doing is it's taking the exact positions and motions of as, as many stars throughout our galaxy and local galaxies as we can and, and plotting their motions. And we're starting to find streams of stars that you can't see. We'll never be able to see them because it's like one star here, one star there. But once we have their exact motions and their orbits, we know that they're connected. And so we know that these are previous, these are the little million particles, little dwarf, satellite, dwarf galaxies that are now being disrupted in our galaxy. And we're finding these now for the first time. The, the, the papers are just coming out now. It's super exciting work. And the reason it's even more exciting, not just finding the streams, which is what I work on, but um, Newton said that if you have an orbit, if two things are in gravitation, gravitational, if one thing is in orbit around another thing, you can calculate the total mass inside that orbit. So as we find streams further and further away, further out in our galaxy, we're not only finding the total mass of our galaxy now and finding that there's not enough in the middle and too much in the outsides, but we're actually mapping it to a certain amount of precision that the physicists are now excited that they think that they could start studying exactly what the dark matter particles are. And this is the, the, just the level of precision that's now available to throughout our entire galaxy. It means that, that the discussions of dark matter and the discussions of dark matter particles is, is really pretty much happening all the time in astronomy and in physics right now. And I will, just one more comment. And what I think is amazing, what I truly love is when I go to a science conference, that's, you know, we talk about how many streams, where are the streams, how many particles in the streams, like what are the, you know, exact positions, exact motions, in order to try to constrain what these dark matter theories and dark matter particles are. And when I talk to my friend Wilfred, and when I listen to Leroy, they talk about dark matter in a completely different way. And and it's equivalent, and I learn so much by being able to um, think of dark matter as more than just this thing that's separate from me and separate from my colleagues and separate from humans. They think of it as part of us, as, and, I, and I can't do as good a job, and I won't even try to explain how everything is connected. They, they just did this. So to see to listen to them and to see this, it makes me appreciate how much is missing in our stories in Western science. We can make the measurements and we can, you know, go through all this incredible training in order to, to you know, make these measurements in a way, in a good way, but to bring that in to what the human condition is and to feel it is something that we do not have. And I really respect and appreciate what I learned from Wilfred, from Leroy, and what Kent, I don't know how you manage, manages to put this on, on, on canvas mm -hmm. to show everybody. I don't know how you do this, but it's amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I'd like to build off of, thank you for that, and uh, thank you all for these, like, it is so rich, I feel like we could be here for the evening, and I wish we could stay. But I, I would like to, because I had this incredible honor of, of going through the exhibit today with all of you, I'd like to ask our three middle panelists here if uh, they want to respond to some of the incredible work that we see more specifically within Kent's exhibition. Uh, because I hear resonances uh, from all of you with some of the ideas, and there are so many in the exhibit. Uh, but I think of the multidimensionality of mischief. I think of the idea of uh, the particles uh, that show up in various paintings and morph and change and connect all the different um, beings that we encounter within it. And I think of the relationship the relationality uh, that you've been speaking of, that we are not separate from the plants and the animals, and indeed history mischief sort of allows us to collapse history and to be 
in all these incredible places in such a short span of time. That's in, so that's my feeling about it. But I wanted to ask uh, any of the panelists here if they wanted to, to comment on uh, what they ex something that they experienced within the show. Um, and there's a lot there, so I'll give you a moment to think on it. Mm. Well, uh, one, of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the concepts that really uh, stuck out for me uh, going through all this, uh, looking at all this, all the amazing uh, work in the, in, the, in the art is uh, the concept of the, of the stardust and how that, uh, that force, that energy is there and uh, our elder, uh, Leroy, and, and his wife, uh, Amethyst, they uh, mentioned that dust, that fine dust that, that's always around. You look at, look at the plants, look at the animals, even in the air, we're constantly breathing this in. And stardust, that's what that is, it's stardust, and we're breathing this in. You see particles in the air. One of the uh, important dances we have as uh, in Enio, Green people is uh, the uh, the Sundance in, this, in in the summertime, and the, the tree we use we call it Ukumawa Atik, and it's the uh, the light, the tree of life, and basically uh, there's there's a star in that tree inside inside the uh, the trunk of that tree, but not only that there's a fine dust every springtime there's a fine dust that covers that tree, and that fine dust is stardust. Mm -hmm. Connects connect that energy, it brings that energy that we all need. And uh, I know uh, Leroy was mentioning something about that dust this, this morning when we were going through. Mm -hmm. Very interesting notions. Yeah, and I wish we had more uh, clock time <laughs> to talk about these things. But firstly, before I really get, go to your uh, question, Lisa, is <clears throat> uh, Kim was talking about, you know, astrophysics and so on. And our astrophysicists, you know, have been trying to understand the whole notion about dark matter. And I was teasing her about a T-shirt that says, if it's not dark, it's not matter. <laughs> you know. But the thing is, the thing is, you see, in our stories, one of those stories is, you know, from the plains, from my people. And that story is, you know, by the anthropologists and so on referred to it as, as Scarface story. And Scarface did have a scar on his face, but in order to get rid of the scar, he had to go to, he went and he was directed to go to see, and see the sun. See? And it's a long story, so we don't really have time to really think about you know, get into it. But when it comes to science, that is, what's from a Western point of view, all of this, if you can think about indigenous science being based on energy waves as opposed to matter, energy waves, similar to quantum physics, what it is, that story is really about going to the sun, which is a form of energy. It's all energy waves, so on. But beyond that, we can start talking about dark matter. And if you can think about it as, hey, Think about it as your ordinary kitchen radio. If you put it on the AM dial, let's say, all it does, you know, usually the ordinary kitchen radio starts from 500, is it megahertz and so on? 
and goes all the way up to 1,600, okay? So, in other words, when an alignment takes place, you hear the music or you hear the talk. But when there's no alignment, then you hear nothing but static. See? And so, but the radio itself, it doesn't begin to say that from five to 1600 is the end of, or the total range of existence. There's infra and there's ultra, see. Well, the thing is, in our stories, we need the sun, we need the sun. It's our mediator to go beyond, to go beyond, see. And in Western science, we're not talking about the mediator, see? And consequently, it's kind of like dealing in ultra or infra waves. And therefore, doesn't make sense to us. We know it's there, but it doesn't quite, you know, make sense to us. Okay. So, and here on Earth, we also have these mediators, okay? And I see and saw a great big buffalo as part of the display. And see, when we think about it, bovine animals came into existence through that flux about 15 to 20 million years ago, scientists tell us, when you compare that to humans coming into existence, humans came in about 250,000 years ago. That's when the Homo species or beginnings of the homo species came into existence. Well, think about that buffalo as a bovine. It's been around for a long time. We came in 250,000 years ago. We're brand new kids on the block. <laughs> We're like teenagers. You know, think about teenagers. <laughs> they know everything. <laughs> and it isn't until they're inching up on the 30, they start to say, oh, I better go and ask grandma. I better go and ask grandpa. They were telling me a story and so on, way back. See? So that's the reason why, you know, like for instance, that buffalo is that intermediary to that knowledge. 15 million years of knowledge memory, see, to our 250,000. So we need that intermediary, that buffalo as an example, to be able to bring about knowledge that goes beyond our radio, you know, capacity, limited capacity, to be able to go infra and ultra. See? So that's what, you know, it seems to me, the story and so on that was told by being legendary you know, the artwork uh, really, really brought about Leroy, that change. Leroy, you've yeah. lost your voice. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. Let me help you. Yeah.
Sometimes people are irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you didn't, that didn't quite hear the end of that, it really, it really is about that intermediary, the buffalo, could be the fish. In fact, the fish, 450 million years that it can draw on compared to our 250,000 years. So that's the ultra infra stories and so on that our elders come up with. That's the science. Mm. Oh. Kim? Yes. <laughs> uh, where to begin? Um, uh, so, uh, I, I hope that you've seen Kent's uh, um, the, the exhibition. It's it's amazing, and uh, I, I can't possibly um, explain something as beautiful as that. Uh, mm -hmm. What I can do, though, is uh, maybe explain a little bit more of why there's so much pink paint mm -hmm. <laughs> in in the origins uh, paintings, and uh, and again, this is. Um, an imprint of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the element with one proton, one electron, simplest atom out there, most abundant atom in the universe, even to this day. And when hydrogen gets heated up, the electron and proton separate, and when it recombines, the electron will go through different energy levels and emit light. And the most common, the brightest of those lines will be H alpha, which emits in pink light. So any origins, any star formation, any, any formation of anything that's legendary and important will shine pink. <laughs> Should I stop there? Yeah, yeah I, I did want to ask you if you felt that um, you could speak to, as a scientist, uh, who's been exposed to these kinds of ideas that we're hearing here, uh, incredible PhD level and beyond uh, of indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, could you talk about how you could see these kinds of understandings coming into dialogue with Western science or where there could be an opening or, or what maybe Western science could learn from indigenous ways of knowing? Wow, that's a huge question. <laughs> oh, that's and uh, we have six minutes. Six yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get the short version. Then. <laughs> huh? So, so num number one, um, I, I do believe that science in general uh, is recognizing the importance of not existing in an echo chamber any longer. So being a woman in science, there have been very few of me in, in my career, and so I've seen the growth of women. Women in astronomy are now about 30%, which is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and yet women of color, men of color, and indigenous ways of knowing, and indigenous scholars, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, the small numbers that are still in any form of science, uh, truly heartbreaking. And uh, where I think science loses out is in is in the different perspectives and different ways of knowing. Uh, women in science have definitely had an impact. And, and you said this so beautifully, both of you said this, that you know, once you put the observer into the reality, you impact the outcome. Yeah. And we see this, and, and it is absolutely necessary, I think, for um, indigenous scientists to be in science. But then I think this is to the benefit of science, which you know, I'm a member of, and therefore I think you know, I'm motivated that way, but I try to channel Wilfred when I can, and uh, and I, you know, what's in it for, for Wilfred? What's in it for Indigenous cultures? And I don't know. I would actually like to ask that question. Um, I think that Indigenous cultures are certainly have been around longer, mm -hmm. right? Western science is constantly leading to a new revolution and a new this and a new phone. 
it's not sustainable. It's, and it's you know, increasingly inhuman. And so I don't think that this is the way forward. I think the way forward will have indigenous leaders. And uh, I don't know what that looks like, but I welcome it and would, and I, and I welcome what you two are doing. You're at the forefront of this already. I would like to uh, leave one thought with the uh, audience, and that is, and let me, let me explain it this way, and that is, these two scientists, and it was kind of, it's kind of the vogue on the part of scientists to go and have a conversation with the Dalai Lama, okay? And so, to some extent, it's still, it's still the vogue, but there was a time when a lot of scientists, for a lack of a better word, visit the Middle East and so on and seek out these, if I could say, medicine men over there. Well, these two scientists made an arrangement with this knowledge person and they went to visit him. And when they arrived, he was already for them. He told them, hey, in our tradition, we had to make tea for our visitors. So he got busy and made some tea for them. When the tea was ready, he took the pitcher and started pouring the tea into the cup. And the cup was full, but he kept pouring. It was spilling all over the place. These two scientists were looking at each other. What's, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> so finally one of them said, hey, the cup is full. It's spilling all over. And he kind of says, oh, okay. Then he looked at the two guys and he says, you know what? You guys know too much. How about if you go back home and empty your minds out a little bit? Because if we talk right now, that knowledge will be like this cup. It'll just spill over. And we won't learn anything. So how about if you go back home and, t and empty your cup, at least some of it out, then come back and we'll talk. See, in our ceremonies, most of our ceremonies are about emptying your cup, emptying your mind, and so on. Very different from Western education. Western education is about filling my mind up loading it with all the junk, the junk mail, and so on. Okay. Well, the thing is, in our, in our ways of knowing, it's really emptying the cup out, clearing your mind. That's what our ceremonies are about, so new knowledge can come about. See? And that's why you go and see an elder, and so on, for a teaching, they always hold a ceremony. Mm -hmm. And in Western science, in our modern world, ceremony is missing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Hey, hey. Thank you all. That was uh, unbelievable and uh, very grateful. I want to thank you all for being part of this conversation, which is only a beginning and yet was so rich with things to take away and think on for a long time, take it into yourself. 
Um, I just want to thank everyone here. I want to thank the ROM for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I'm going to invite uh, someone to just do a little bit of housekeeping before we wrap for tonight. Oh, oh hey, Lisa. Anine. Uh, my name is Leslie. I'm the manager of Indigenous Learning and Programs. I just wanted to say Chimigwech, thank you all so much for being here, traveling to the ROM this evening, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, and also bringing humor in the space. I think uh, Romulans should start trending here at ROM. <laughs> um, and I want to thank each of you as well. Thank you so much for spending your evening here with us. We're very, very grateful. Also, just, uh, yeah. just before we go, I just want to say, uh, like to uh, forget to uh, acknowledge uh, Lisa for the work that she, she does and just being Lisa Jackson. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, shall we? Thank you.